two-way wireless product family for M1 controls. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Jessie Bumgarner and I am the marketing coordinator here at ELK. Our presenter today is Amy Strickland. She is our tech support queen. Before we get started, I want to remind all of you about some of our trade shows ELK will be participating in in the next couple of weeks. Uh, next Wednesday, April 24th, ELK will be at the AAF show in Orlando, Florida. Thursday, May 9th, we will be at the NCESA show in Concord, North Carolina. And our next big show we will be at is ESX in Nashville. So be sure to mark your calendars and come visit the ELK booth 241, June 19th and 20th. You can see all of our events throughout the year on our website, elkproducts.com. And also, just a quick reminder to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn for all upcoming events, trainings, and get the inside scoop of new products and insights. We will be recording and posting this webinar on our YouTube channel for your convenience after the webinar. Uh, be on the lookout for our follow-up email with a link to our webinar and other useful information early next week. And during this webinar, if you have any questions at all, please type your question in the questions box of the GoToWebinar control panel on the right side of your, of your screen. During this webinar, if you have questions, uh, we'll answer them as we go. Um, but if your question is not answered, uh, we will address them in a follow-up email. So now, without further ado, I would like to introduce to you Amy Strickland. Thank you, Jesse, and I uh, thank everyone here for being with us this afternoon um, or this morning, depending on where you may be. We're going to go over the new ELK two-way wireless product, so let's just dive right in. Um, I want to start by talking about the wireless options that are available for the M1. Um, we have our traditional wireless options. Um, you've got a, the M1 XR FEG wireless receiver, which is compatible with the GE format transmitters. Um, that goes on the M1 data bus and can support up to 144 zones with GE format sensors. And then we also have the M1 XRF2H, which is compatible with the Honeywell 5800 series transmitters. Again, connects to the data bus and provides 144 zones. So those are your traditional wireless options. Those are one-way communication. And so what we're going to spend time talking about today is two-way wireless. Um, this is a relatively new product for ELK. Um, the receiver or transceiver is the M1 XRFTW, and this is compatible with ELK's own two-way wireless sensors. So the sensors that work with this receiver are those that are manufactured by ELK products, and we're going to go over those today, including introducing you to our wireless motion detector that we're going to be coming out with really soon. So, so you may be asking yourself, why has ELK developed wireless products? There's, you know, obviously other options that we've had in place for a while, so, so why are we developing our own wireless products? Um, we felt like it was an obvious extension to our product offering. Wire, uh, wireless is such a big part of the market and it's a growing part of the, the market, so we felt like it would be a good idea for us to offer our own wireless product. It is something that we have been asked for. Um, we wanted to provide a, a wireless solution that was comparable to the robustness of our M1 product. Um, I know a lot of you are familiar with the M1. Um, there's a lot that you can do with that product and it's a, it's a very robust product and we wanted to offer something that was in line with, with where that is uh, in comparison to, to the M1. Um, we also wanted to be able to provide that complete solution with you know, the features that uh, a lot of people had asked us for and also the quality that you would expect from ELK. Um, so that's you know, some of the reasons why we decided to go into the wireless market with the M1. It is something that we had uh, people ask us about, um, even in tech support, you know, people will call and be like, oh, okay, so what wireless motion detector should I use with the M1? What ELK part is that? And so this is something we felt like um, we could would feel a need there. So how is ELK 
two-way different from the wireless that you may be familiar with already. Um, we feel like we've um, added some innovative features into our wireless lineup. Um, here's just an, an overview on your screen. You're seeing there the positive signal acknowledgement, um, the frequency hopping, our bicolor status LEDs, the adjusting power levels, and also the in installation confidence feature. And I'm going to go over each one of those for you in detail and, and explain what we mean by those things. So traditional wireless systems are one way. Um, the transmitter, when it gets tripped, it has no choice but to just blindly send multiple signals hoping that one will get to the receiver. It doesn't know whether or not that happens, so it just has to blast out you know, a number of signals and, and hoping that one gets through. With the ELK two-way wireless, when the sensor is tripped, the signal goes out to the transceiver, the transceiver receives that, and then actually sends back an acknowledgement to the sensor. So, you know, you've got that acknowledgement there, the transceiver got the signal, the sensor then knows that happened, and it doesn't need to send out another signal. So you've got that reliability that's built in with having that kind of acknowledgement, and also, um, you know, saving power and not having to constantly transmit at, at full power, you know, multiple signals just hoping it gets through. It sends the, the signal one time, waits for the acknowledgement. When it gets it, it stops sending. So again, reliability and also saving on uh, battery life there, two benefits of doing that. Um, we work in the 900 megahertz frequency, which provides long-range coverage. And we also have a feature um, that's frequency hopping. So we can actually um, change the frequency that we're transmitting at. It's within that 900 megahertz range, but we change that frequency. So if uh, you know the sensor sends a signal, it doesn't get the acknowledgement back. It's going to change to another frequency, make an adjustment to the power as well, and send again. So you've, again, you've got that robustness built in of, of being able to use all of these features combined to make sure your signals are getting through. We also have bicolor status LEDs on all of the sensors. So you're going to see when that sensor, um, it, when you violate the sensor, you're going to see a green LED come on it that tells you that the signal was acknowledged. If you see a red LED, then that means the signal wasn't acknowledged. Um, but again, you know, you, with the door, for instance, you open the door, you're going to see that green LED come on, letting you know that the signal went through. And also on our key fob that we offer, you're actually going to get status information about what's going on with the system at that time. So you've got a red LED when the system is armed, green when it's disarmed, and even a flashing red when there's an active alarm. So you can see what's going on with the system, what state it's in before you even you know, enter the premise. And so that's a, a nice feature. That's uh, really one of my favorite things about the two-way with that key fob is getting that status information. What I would like to try to do at this point is to show you a very short video. Um, not 100% sure this is going to work, so if you cannot see the video, just uh, type that in the question field and let us know. Again, we're just sort of trying something here. So hopefully you're going to be able to see the video that is playing on the screen right now. Um, so you can see if you press the blue button on the key fob, it shows you that the system's armed. That's the in inquiry button. We can disarm the system with the green button. And you'll see that actually goes to ready to arm on the keypad. We're arming the system with the yellow button that has the lock indicator on it. And again, you can see that went uh, armed on the keypad, and you've got that red LED showing you that it's armed. Now, if we trip a sensor, and the sensor that you see here is the universal se sensor, and we'll talk about that more in a moment, but you see that green LED, and I, I slowed that down so you could see that um, green LED blinking indicating that the signal got through, and that created a burglar alarm on the system.
So now if we press the blue inquiry button, you'll see that red flashing LED indicating that there is an active alarm. The next thing I want to talk about is the self-adjusting power. And what that means for us is that uh, when the sensor sends a signal, it, it's sending at a particular power level, and that power level is adjusted throughout you know, the, the sending. Um, and so it, the first time it sends, it sends at what it believes to be the optimum power level. Uh, keeping the power at a minimum. But if it, that signal doesn't get through, if it doesn't get the acknowledgement, then it will increase the power level as well as change frequency so that it can get through. But the idea there is that we're not always sending the signal at full power. If that's not necessary, then we can conserve battery power by sending at the minimum amount of power needed to get a clear signal through. And so again, that's part of your, your battery savings. And, and also with the the ability to adjust that, we can um, in increase the reliability of the transmissions. This kind of ties in with the power as well. The installer confidence feature, it, what that is, when you're during the first 10 minutes after the battery's installed, when you would be learning the sensor in, it's going to transmit at 50% of its normal power level. So it's not going to transmit at full power right when you're learning it in. That will help you to make sure that at the mounting location where the sensor's going to be, that you're going to get a good reliable signal. Because it's not all at first going out full 100%, you know that if it will pick up at 50% in that location, then you're going to have a good, reliable, um, you know, long-term signal going through that's going to work for you. Um, so that's a, a nice feature that, again, that's within the first 10 minutes when you're trying to learn the sensors in, when you first put the battery in. Now you may be learning the sensors in through the keypad, in which case you know you're going to get that uh, acknowledgement through the learning process. But if you're learning in through the software, um, then this is something you can you know learn your sensors in, put the batteries in them, and then walk test your system, and and that again allows you to test the reliability of the mounting location and the range. So I'm just going to stop right here for a moment on the screen showing you all the products that we have and, and see if there are any questions that we would need to address at this point. Jesse. Hey, Amy. We currently do not have any questions, but I just want to remind everyone, because I know a few people have just arrived, if you have any questions, uh, just type in your questions on in the question box on the right side of your screen, and we will get to those uh, at any time of the presentation. So good job, Amy. Keep Thank on you. going. Okay, so um, what we're showing on the screen now is the um, products that are available or will soon be available in the case of the motion detector um, for our two-way wireless line at this point. So you can see we have our transceiver unit that connects to the M1 data bus, um, a key fob, um, mini window sensor, a slimline door window sensor and our universal three zone sensor. And then again our, our motion detector is something that's going to be available soon. And so I'm just going to spend a, a few moments talking about each one of these products. We'll start with the transceiver. Um, it allows up to 144 zones, so that's 144 um, points or you know, sensors. Um, so that's a, a pretty good capacity in comparison to some other wireless options that are available. Um, this again connects to the M1 data bus, so you can centrally locate this transceiver to where you get the best coverage out of it. Um, it doesn't have to be right at the control panel. You can run that line on the data bus and, and get that you know in the center of the, the building that you're installing it in. Um, if you do have a large area that you're going to be covering and one transceiver is not going to do the job, then you can have multiple transceivers. You could have up to three to increase the coverage area. And so that's going to allow you to cover a pretty big area um, with, with three of those, or four total. Um, the next thing we'll talk about here is the key fob. 
This key fob allows you to act activate a panic, do you know, basic arming, disarming, things you would expect from a key fob. You can also program the buttons on the key fob to do other functions, like if you wanted to have it open a garage door, turn on a light, that sort of thing. And I'll spend some time um, in LCRP, I'm going to show you, you know, wireless setup and, and that sort of thing. And so I'll show you how you can um, make those button assignments um, in two different ways, um, one being just with the uh, button assignment in the wireless setup, and then we can also route rules. And so I'll, I'll show you a quick example of that here in just a moment. Um, the number three button there, the blue button that you see with the little asterisks on it, um, that is a dedicated inquiry button. So that is not something that you have to worry about programming. Um, but, you, know, you press that button and that's when you get that status information from the LED. Um, it'll let you know whether the system is armed, disarmed, or has alarm memory. Now this key fob features a welded case um, so that it's uh, very water resistant. Um, so that's a, a nice feature. You know, if you uh, get it a little wet, you're not going to have to worry about it. Uh, you know, being being ruined. It's a welded case so that it's sealed up pretty good. You know, the typical battery life on on something like that is you know, five to seven years. So it's going to last a while. I'd, if my husband carried this around for five to seven years, you wouldn't be able to recognize it. So that's a, I think that's a pretty good uh, amount of time for something like that. Now we're going to talk about the 6020, which is our slimline door window sensor. Um, it's very um, small size and slim um, size, so that it's uh, it's pretty discreet. You're not going to um, have a you know a big box on the wall with this one. It's, it's a pretty discreet sensor. Um, it has one built-in read switch, and it has a front and back tamper option. So this is good for uh, most door and window applications. And this is a, just a single zone read switch. There's no internal contacts on this particular sensor. Now this mini window sensor is, is extremely thin. So this is good for like your double hung or casement style wood or vinyl windows where you, you know, really don't want to be able to see the sensor at all. And if, if this is installed properly, it's, it's you know, practically um, unseen. And again, it is also one built-in read switch. Um, we do recommend that this particular sensor be mounted within about 100 feet of the transceiver. Because it is so thin and you, you've got everything you know, kind of close to the mounting surface, the range on it is a little bit less than some of the other sensors. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're using this, when you want to have it within about 100 feet of your transceiver. And that comes back into um, what we were talking about just a moment ago with being able to remotely locate the transceiver where it's central or having more than one transceiver if you have a larger area that you need to cover. Now the ELK 6022, which is our universal sensor, it has three zones on it. So there's three possible zones on this sensor. You have one built-in read switch, and then there are two loops um, or two con you know, connections for an external contact inside the, the sensor where you can wire something to it. Um, so the built-in read switch is uh, uh, loop two on the sensor, and then you've got loop one and loop three as your external contacts. And I'll show you where that kind of comes into play here in a moment when we look at the RP software. Um, this is good for garage door sensors if you're going want, wanting to cover multiple sen uh, like doors and windows, or maybe you have some kind of environmental sensor. Maybe it's like a water sen uh, sensor or something like that that you need to be able to wire back in and, and make a you know wireless in that regard. This one also has the uh, front and back tamper option. Now we're going to talk about the newest addition to our product line, which is the PIR motion detector, or motion sensor. Um, it has a lot of really great innovative features. Um, you know, it has a 
keypad initiated walk test mode, which is very unique. Um, traditionally, you would have to, you know, take the the cover off of the motion detector unit, you know, and you're getting out a ladder, climbing up to it, taking the cover off, and you're pressing a, a button or or you know some kind of dip switch setting inside of the sensor to put it in walk test mode. You're not going to have to do that with the sensor. You just put the the walk test mode on at the keypad, and this sensor is going to be in walk test mode. Um, it also has an industry first, which is the security and convenience bright white LED, and that LED is actually you know projecting a, a pretty significant beam of light. So it, it's not just a, an indicator LED; it's actually going to provide some light. Um, that can provide um, momentary activation during walk test mode, which can be very convenient because the if, if you're walking around, the the small LED may not be. Um, you know, very visible to you, so you're going to get that white LED, which you're definitely going to see when you're in the walk test mode. You also get uh, flashing during audible alarm activation, and you can also program the on activation of that LED through rules. Um, you might use that to illuminate an area for camera assistance or to provide like pathway lighting at night, that kind of thing. Um, so I, I'll go over that briefly um, in the RP software as well. This sensor also has a long battery life and two selectable sleep mode durations. So, you, um, as you may be aware, with most motion detectors that are wireless, in order to conserve battery power, they go into a, a sleep mode. Um, you know, that's generally a predetermined amount of time between when you can, you know, get activations on the motion detector. We give you two options on this one, which is selectable with the dip switch. We expect this product to be available at a distributor near you sometime in May, so that's not, not too long from now. And I'd like to just um, very briefly um, show you a quick video that demonstrates some of the really uh, neat features of this motion detector. So again, if you have any problems seeing the video, um, to just, just let us know. So here you can see, you know, having to get up on a ladder versus being able to go to the keypad. And it's three easy key presses to get into walk test mode. And you now have the motion detector in walk test. And you can see that bright LED is just very visible. So you're going to definitely know that it worked. Um, you also get the green light on it to indicate that you're getting the acknowledged signal. And this uh, short video is just going to give you a, a demonstration of, of that bright white LED and some of the other applications. Um, you know, like if this one's particular is about an alarm condition. So the customer's arming the system there. And then you've got your big bad burglar coming in. You know, the system's going into alarm. That you see that light, that LED comes on and you know, he's quick to get out of there with all of that activity going on. So you get a flashing when the alarm is triggered by a door or window and you get solid when it's actually the motion detector that is going into alarm. I'm going to pause here for just a moment and see if we have any questions about any of the products that we just went over. Hey Amy, we do have a few questions. Um, I'm just going to start off with the people that asked first. Uh, is there a motion detector, is the motion detector pet immune? This particular version is not a pet immune okay. motion detector. And what is the battery life of the sensors? Okay, so I'm um, looking at the key fob again. That's you know roughly five to seven years, depending on the usage. The slimline door window sensor is around seven years. Um, the the very thin mini window sensor is around. Um, hold on, just a second. I just had that in front of me. Um, that's around three years. 
the universal three zone sensor is around seven years and then this motion detector is also um, typically around seven years on the battery life. Okay, for, the, for right now that's all. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks. All right, now I'm just going to go over a few installation tips about these products for you. Um, one thing that's very important, um, when you are working with this um, M1XRFTW transceiver unit, it has to be set to address 2. Your first M1XRFTW has to be set to address 2 on the data bus. Um, you can't start that at any other address. If you have additional transceivers, they must follow sequentially. So you could have a maximum of four of the M1 XRFTW units on an M1 panel. You're going to have to set those up as addresses two, three, four, and five. Um, and again, you can't really waver from that. Um, there are no hardwired zones can be installed in the groups that are occupied by a transceiver. So again, if you have the uh, the TW, you have a couple of those, and you're not going to be able to have any hardwired zones in that section. So those are some very important points. And if you're adding this to a system that is existing, this may mean you may have to move things around a little bit. And, and you know what that entails just it, it depends on what you have on the system, but. Um, yeah, it's something to keep in mind. On the 6022, which is our universal sensor, um, again, it has the external contact loops. That sensor ID number can be learned into three different zones. So you can have one zone learned in as the read switch, and that would be set to loop two, and then you can have one zone learned in as loop one for an external contact, and another learned as loop three for an external contact. So it could have up to three zones occupied on the system. Now you don't necessarily have to use all three. Um, you don't have to leave a space or anything in your wireless setup for all three, but you, it is possible to have them learned in that way. Um, loop one and loop three share a common negative, so when you look at the inside of that sensor, you're going to see three screw terminals. You're going to have your loop one, loop three, and then the common negative in between. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're wiring. Um, the external contact is set up to be normally open, uh, or excuse me, normally closed. If you want it to be normally open, you need to enable option two on wireless setup, and I'll show you that here in just a moment. Any questions about that stuff? And we typically get some questions about the uh, addressing. Just wanted to make sure we're not that that was clear and we didn't have any questions there. All right. So um, the next thing we're going to talk about is enrolling the sensors. There are two different ways to do that. You can either enroll them from a keypad, or you can enroll them in the LCRP software by entering ID numbers. Now, enrolling from the keypad um, is a, a good method uh, if you don't uh, necessarily have the ID numbers. Of course, they are going to be labeled on the sensors. But some people also just like to do that because you're also getting some signal acknowledgement. So you're kind of you know two birds, one stone there. Other people like to do it through the RP software because it's just easier to type in numbers. So you can, you can do it either way. There's not necessarily any particular benefit one over the other um, beyond your, your preference of doing that. And I'm going to just uh, quickly show you here with a, a short video how you would learn that in through the keypad. So what I've got here is the universal sensor, and I'm just opening the case there so that you can see the inside of that. And you see those screw terminals I was just talking about. It's important to make note of the polarity um, so that you make sure that you put the battery in right. That's important. You want to you know, orient yourself with that um, prior to getting started. Then you can just press the ELK key on your keypad. Nine will get you into installation programming. And of course, you're going to enter your installer code. Default is 172839. You're going to go into menu 14, so you can just key in 14 to take you to wireless setup. Right arrow into that. 
And then option three is our learn transmitter option. Right arrow into that, and we're going to select the zone that we want to learn in. In this case, it's going to be zone 30. And press your right arrow key, and it's going to tell you to push the transmitter button. Um, at that point, you want to install the battery. You're going to get a tone acknowledgement from the keypad, and you'll also see the ID number pop up briefly. It's going to then advance to the next zone for you. Um, and so if you were learning in a lot of zones, you could just kind of keep going through, putting the batteries in, and advancing to the next zone. That's for your convenience. Once you're done, you want to hit the ELK key and go back to the zones that you've learned in. So we're going to look at zone 30 here, and you can see the ID number there. And we want to set the loop assignment here. So if we wanted to use the internal read, this is where we would set loop 2. Um, if it was one of the external contacts, we would set one of the other loop numbers. And then you're just going to press the ELK key to acknowledge that. So you can see that's not an extremely difficult process. And again, with the way that it advances for you, it does make it easy to learn in multiple zones from a keypad. So now I'm going to take you into the Elk RP software and show you how wireless setup works in Elk RP. I just have a, an account open here that I've created for two-way wireless. And I'm going to go under Zones Inputs. Right now I have the hardwired main board and I have a hardwired input expander at, at, at 11, again anticipating that I'm going to have a number of wireless zones. The, the hardwired is, is pushed back to one of the higher addresses. So if you right click on zones inputs, then you're going to get the option for new hardwired zones or new wireless zones. We want to select new wireless zones. And here you'll get uh, the screen that allows you to see what groups you want to set it to. So we're just going to start out here with group 2, which is going to be zone 17 through 32. And now you'll see here on the screen I've got my 17 through 32. All of these zones are disabled. They're not named. You know, they're, they're just blank zones at this point. So let's double click on zone 17 and take a look at that. We can name that zone whatever we'd like. Let's just say this is a uh, um, patio door, for instance. So I've just named that patio door. Um, this is you know, your typical zone setup. We're going to set that with the zone definition. We want that one to be a, a, an entry exit zone. So we're just going to set that up as entry exit 1. We need to leave it set to type 0 here. You'll see that applies to um, hardwired zones with an, e an end of line resistor or to wireless zones. Um, if you're running um, a slightly older version of software, you'll see this notated as EOL supervised slash RF, but it's still type 0 is what you want to select there, type 0. Um, here you could set the area and you know, choose whether or not the zone's bypassable, if you have the chime on the zone. Um, so again, all this is typical for your zone setup. Now we're going to go into the wireless setup, and we access that from this button here. That brings up this other little screen that you'll see. And here's where we can set the parameters for the wireless. So most of your wireless zones are going to be normal supervision. So we can see that. But you can also see here your other options would be not supervised, which would be the correct option for a key fob, and then fire supervision if you, you had a fire zone, which we don't, uh, we don't have our smoke detector available yet. But uh, that, yeah, that's what that's about. Um, so when you're working with the ELK wireless, you're actually going to put your ID number into the TXID field. And so you'll see that ID number on the label. Um, there'll be a, a letter like A and then some other characters. That's, uh, that's what you're going to want to enter in here as that information. So. Let me just put one of these in here. All right, and you'll see when I do that, it actually fills in these other fields with other information. That's not really all that important, what that is. You know, you, again, you're going based on the TXID number, and we do have it labeled that way. 
So now here in this section is where we have that loop number. So if this happened to be one of these universal sensors, this is where we would want to set the loop number. And let's just say, for instance, we were using the read switch on that, we would want to set that to loop 2. If we were going to have that be um, the normally open, like we were talking about before, we'd also want to set option 2 here. So that's you know the basic wireless setup. Now I'm going to go into um, zone 18 here, and, and let's just say that's my key fob. That's Amy's key fob. Amy locks key fobs. So um, I'm going to set me up a key fob here. I need to go down and choose the key fob as the zone definition. Again, leaving it at type 0. And so now I want to go into the wireless setup here, and again, you're just uh, you know you're putting in your your ID number on the transmitter. And we'll just put this one in as so we put in that ID number. And here we can set a key fob user ID. So that would be for logging purposes. If you wanted to have the log, um, you know, that associated with the user, let's just say I'm user one, and I want to see that I, you know user one is the, the one that armed the system here, you can do that. Uh, another, again, another important thing is this uh, supervision. So a key fob should be not supervised. Um, one of the things I do occasionally get tech support calls is, you know, a lost transmitter, and we look into the log and we see, okay, well, that's the, the key fob um, zone number. Um, so we come here and see that it's still set up for supervision. So that's something that you'll want to keep in mind when you're setting up key fobs. You want them to be not supervised because you're going to be taking that with you and it's going to be out of the range of the receiver. Now, we provided this uh, quick, easy button for you here to get into the wireless setup to set up the zone-specific parameters, but there's another wireless setup option in the software here under zones inputs. You have your wireless setup category. So you can see here where I have the two zones that I've set up on this transmitters uh, table. All of that's yellow because I haven't saved it. If I click save, it all turns back white. Um, so that just gives you a nice table view of all of your zones. But another important thing that you'll find on the, this wireless setup is the key fob events. And so this is where you have that uh, definition of what those keys do. By default, you have button 1 as your arm away, button 2 as your disarm. That's your yellow and green buttons on your key fob, respectively. Again, button 3 is your inquiry button, and there's no programming associated with that. You don't have to set anything up for programming there. But it is possible to have this button 3 also do another function if you press and hold it for approximately 4 to 5 seconds. So uh, you know, a quick press is going to give you your status indication. But if you wanted to have this button do something else, you could you know, do that long press and hold for 4 to 5 seconds. And you could have that um, set up to you know, be um, like opening a garage door, turning on lights, activating an automation task. If you have an automation task that you want to activate, you can um, assign it to that button here on this screen. So you could set it up there like automation task 1, or you can just write rules to do it. It just depends on whether or not you're calling up a function that you've already written a task for, or if you're just going to be doing something with that button that you're not doing with anything else, you can just write the rule for it. I'll show you that here in just a moment. Now the red button, the number four button on the key fob, is typically set up for a panic. It's not that way by default, but that's what a lot of people like to do with it. So you could set that up as a police alarm, for instance, and that would be a, a good uh, panic button for you. Um, you can get other functions with the key fob by doing multiple button presses, and that's where these other um, button assignments would come in. And so if that's something that you're interested in doing, that is outlined in the uh, instructions as far as what you would get out of that. But uh, you know, typically you've got your, just your four buttons that you're going to be setting up. Any questions at this point? Um, I had a question on uh, the universal sensor work with all three loops, and I know they all work together, but do, does the TXID, would that be the same for all three loops? Yes, it would. Um, so if we were to go back here into the zones and, and say we wanted to set up 
you know, zone 19 um, as, as your loop 1, for instance, and you probably wouldn't name it that, but you would go in here and put in this same ID number that I entered a moment ago. Um, you wouldn't have to change that or increment that up a number or anything. I know that's how some of the other wireless works, but ours, you just put in the same number there, and then you would set this to, to loop 1. And you could learn that, you know, I could have uh, zone 20 here set up as my loop 3. Again, doing the same thing, just putting in this same ID number um, and, and setting it to loop 3. I had a question on, uh, can programming for the system be done fully from a computer screen versus doing the sensor keypad routine? Um, I answered yes, and also can programming be, uh, can it be done by using a config.ini file instead of entering the data zone, zone by zone? No. Um, your two options for learning sensors in are the keypad method that we showed you or entering the information into this software. Those are your two options. So the uh, control file that that person's asking about is not an option with this. Okay. And then earlier you stated that your first wireless zones need to be in group number two. If you're adding on to an, an existing system with hardwire zones in group numbers two, three, four, et cetera, is it necessary to reassign the hardware zones in the existing hardwire group number two then utilize group number two for the wireless zones? Yes, it would be necessary to reconfigure the zones at that point. So if you're adding the two-way wireless to an existing system that already has hardwired input expanders at address two, um, you know, three, four, five, well, it just depends on how many um, zones you're going to have and also how many transceivers you're going to put in. But yes, you would have to change the address on the hardwired input expanders um, to a higher number address outside of the wireless zones that you're going to be using. Set the two-way wireless transceiver to address two and then re-enroll everything and then you would have to, to go through the process of, of manually reassigning those hardwired zones. So um, on an existing system if you're adding this, I, you know, that, that can be a, a bit of a process for you but uh, you know, this software does allow you to um, you know, create a, a, a printout of your zones so that you can easily put those back into the software. Um, you know, doing that from the software shouldn't take too long, just depending on how many zones you have. And I know some of you may be cringing at the thought of doing that, but uh, you know, that's that's going to be in that case where you're adding this two-way wireless to a system that uh, already has hardwired input expanders. So maybe you won't have to do that too much, but you would have to go through that process. Thank you, Amy. No problem. Okay, I'm going to take just a, a moment here to show you a couple of things in the rules section. Um, the first thing I want to show you is how you could write a rule to assign you know, some kind of function to one of those uh, buttons that, that's not available from the key fob event screen. So here I'm just creating a new rule and I'm going to go into the whenever section. And you'll see here you have key fob button press. So we can select that. And then we can pick which button we want to assign a function to. So for my example, we're going to assign a function to, to button 3. So I'm just going to make that selection there for button 3 and then click OK. You can see whenever RF key fob button 3 is activated. Now we can go to then and let's say we wanted to open or close a garage door with this button. We would go to turn output on off and I don't think I have one actually assigned here to garage door. I'm just going to assume that my output 7 is my garage door. And we could turn that on for just a few seconds. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm just going to turn output 7 on for two seconds each time that button is pressed. And so that could act as a, a toggle for your garage door. But again, keeping in mind with button 3 that you would have to press and hold that button for several seconds to get that activation. Now another thing I want to show you here in the rules section is just, uh, you know, we were talking about that uh, unique 
bright white LED on the 6030 motion detector that's going to be coming out really soon. And I wanted to just give you a quick example of how you might use that. Um, so here in programming, I'm going to start a new rule. And, and here's the scenario for my example. Um, let's just say you know, you're, you're vacuuming and you can't hear the phone ring. Um, you may want to flash the LED on the motion detector when the phone rings so that it would draw attention to the fact that the phone's ringing. You can turn your vacuum cleaner off and go answer the phone. Um, you know, this, that's just one example out, out of many that you may use that LED for. But I'll show you how that particular rule would be written for that example. So we go here to whenever and under miscellaneous system, we're going to go under other, and you're going to see here you've got some options related to telephone. We're going to select telephone line is ringing. Now we can go to the then section and choose turn output on off, and it is certain outputs on the system that are going to manipulate that LED. Um, so just to give you kind of a rundown, output 4 allows the motion detector to turn on solid. When, when motion is detected. Um, output 5 flashes the LED and output 6 turns the LED on solid. Now if you're um, familiar with the M1, you, you know that outputs 4, 5, and 6 were previously not physically available on the system, so we've made use of those here. So we're going to go to turn output on off in this case, and we want to flash the LED, so I'm going to turn output 5 on for, we're just going to say you know, 15 seconds for instance and then click done. So that's just a, a quick example and you know, we'll, we'll provide more information on that. Um, you, you know, it's going to be in the instructions and we'll continue to provide more information on that as we actually get that product rolled out on the market for you. Let's talk for a moment about why your customers would want the two-way wireless. Again, one of my favorite things is the, the two-way key fob. I just really love the idea of being able to tell um, just by pressing a button whether or not the system is armed, if it's disarmed, and better yet, if there's an alarm. Because if there's an active alarm, I'm probably not going to go in you know, the house or the, the building there. I'm going to want to um, have someone check that out for me before I go in. So that's just a, a really convenient feature. Um, you also have the increased confidence of you know knowing that it uh, is just going to work for you. It's more reliable. Um, it's a lot more like hardwired um, than traditional wireless because you're getting that that status feedback, that uh, acknowledgement of the signal. You know that the signal went through um, when you get that acknowledgement. So that just gives you a lot more reliability and and you know increased reliability just makes you feel more secure. So gives you more confidence in, in using wireless. It also provides extended battery life and that we're not always sending the signal out at 100 percent um, and we don't have to send the signal out all, you know, over and over and over again. So um, over the life of the product that is going to help with the battery life. Now again, the, the motion detector is what we're coming out with next. You can expect to see that sometime in May. Um, but going forward from that, our roadmap for this product line includes a smoke detector and a glass break sensor, as well as a water sensor, a temperature sensor, and we have a few other things in mind that we may do with that. But those are the kind of things that we're um, adding, you know, adding to this uh, the product as we go down the, the road of our Elk two-way wireless. Hey Amy, I also want to include that uh, we are we will have a pet immune PIR coming out soon. Um, so because I had a couple people ask about that, so I just wanted to let everyone know uh, when the PIR comes out, uh, the pet immune PIR will sh uh, shortly arrive after. That's great news. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so we have just a few minutes left. If there are any other questions um, that, that you have, now would be the time to get those into us. Um, Jesse, are there any questions that we haven't gotten around to addressing at this point that we can go ahead and address? Or we've yes, I, I, I have a few. 
Okay. Um, on the 6022, do the external contacts require an inline resistor? That is a really good question. Um, hold on just a second. I want to say off the top of my head they don't, but I just want to double check that. No. No, you do not need an end-of-line resistor. It's set up for a normally closed loop. If you want to make it normally open, then you're going to go in and check that option two that we were talking about, but you do not need a resistor. Okay. Um, on the universal, does the three different zones that show up, um, do they show up as three different zones on VM1? Yes. So I'm just going to quickly hop back over to the ELK RP software um, and show you just this kind of table view of our wireless setup. So you can see here I've got um, zone 17, 19, and 20 are all associated with that same ID number, but they're set to different loop numbers. So those are going to come into the system as those zone numbers, depending on which part of that sensor was stripped. So if it's the loop 1, you're going to get that as zone 19. If it's the read switch, that's going to come in as zone 17. And you can have independent reporting of that as well. Um, so that they're, they're completely separate zones. You're just getting those three zones through one um, transceiver, transmitter, sensor unit. And then, can the battery be replaced in any of the sensors, or do the sensors need re, need to be replaced when the battery dies? No, okay, the battery is replaceable in all of the sensors with the exception of the key fob. Um, because the key fob is a sealed device to provide that extra water resistance, you can't replace the battery in the key fob, but you can replace the battery in the um, slimline, in the mini, and the universal, as well as the motion detector. Those are all replaceable batteries. Can the light on the motion sensor be triggered by different events besides an, an alarm trigger? Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, you know, w with the uh, outputs four, three, five, and six that I was talking about just a moment ago, you can determine when that LED comes on. So let's say, for instance, you wanted to have it, um, you know, come on solid uh, when a certain event occurs. You can turn output six on for however long, and that's going to turn that LED on um, based on that output six activation. Um, and if, if the LED is not something that you you know, want to use in that way, or maybe you want it to work on one motion detector and not another. There is a, uh, a dip switch inside to to set that. So, um, but yeah, you can turn that on with output six. You can make it flash with output five, and you can have it turn on solid when motion is detected, even when the system is disarmed by turning on output four. Uh, can the elk key fob signal be programmed into your car's factory installed garage door opener? I don't believe so. I'm not quite sure I 100% understand that question, but... Um, I'm not I, sure if it does. It, it, I think they're just asking if you can, I guess, synchronize it with your garage Door yeah, I mean, you're, you're not going to be able to make the garage door opener in the car know the key fobs ID. I think that's what they're asking, and maybe maybe some clarification on that. We may need to follow up on that one um, after the webinar, but um, just short answer based on what I think they're asking, no. Uh, can the PIR zone be a cross zone? Yes, it can. Um, you can set that up very, uh, very quickly in the software here. Um, like, let's just say, for instance, this uh, zone 21 was our, our motion detector. Um, you could set it up as in the cross zone pool there um, just by checking that box. And then you're either going to have to trip that zone and another zone that's in the cross zone pool, or if you have the self-verify option set up, um, and I'll just very quickly show you where that is here in the global section under the zones. If you have um, cross on self-verify, then it could be you know two separate trips of the motion detector. But then also keep in mind that the motion detector does have a selectable pulse count on it as well. 
Um, so that's something that uh, that you can keep in mind there, but you can definitely have it in crawl zone. Okay. Um, if button one of our key fob is programmed to turn on a few house lights, will the key fob let us know that the elk has received the signal by lighting up the light on the key fob? Now the LED indicator on the key fob is um, for system status and again that shows us whether a system is arm, disarm, or in alarm. So you're not going to get any feedback on that key fob LED that a light turned on. Okay. And then I have just a few more and then we'll wrap the things up. Uh, does the M1 system also communicate with the user using the GSM digital network or through the internet? Okay, I think this question is about uh, reporting the alarms. And, um, you can send reports on the M1 either through a standard phone line, um, through um, you know cellular communications. Um, there are a couple of options there. Um, just to name a couple would be Uplink or, or TailGuard, but there are some other ones that you can use. Um, and also our M1 XEP um, will allow you to send reports to your central station over IP. So those options are available. Um, you'll find more information about that kind of thing on our website. Okay. And then is the PIR inside use only? Yes. This is an indoor unit. It is not designed to be put in a non-climate controlled environment or one that you know, may be subject to weather. It, it is designed for in, indoor use. Okay, and then I'm, we have time for just one more, and then all the other questions that we do not answer, we will follow up in a email. Uh, but my last one is, can multiple wireless manufacturers be used with your panel at the same time? That is a very good question and one I was surprised we hadn't gotten to yet. Um, the answer to that is yes, you can. So again, we have the three different options, the Elk Wireless, which we've been talking about today, and the um, GE and Honeywell that we briefly discussed at the very beginning of this presentation. It is possible to have those all, you know, a mixed system where say you have the Elk Wireless and some Honeywell or some GE sensors as well. The key thing to remember there, well there are a couple, um, the thing that we were kind of driving home about the addressing. You have to have your two-way tr transceiver set to address two. Um, any additional two-way transceivers you have have to follow sequentially. So that would mean that you would have, if you had a, say, a Honeywell um, receiver, the XRF2H, then you're going to have to have that set at a higher address, um, you know, out of the way of the two-way addresses. Now, with the wireless, it's not so much uh, important where the sensors get learned in as far as, um, you know, if you have a two-way address two, that doesn't necessarily mean that you can only have two-way sensors at 17 through 32. That part's not quite as, as key as, you know, with the hardwired, you would have to move them. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is if you had, say, a system that already had some GE on it and you had those sensors learned in, it, you know, say you had four or five, you had them learned in starting at 17, going up through, you know, 21, whatever the case may be there. Um, you wouldn't have to move the receiver to a different address, but you wouldn't necessarily have to move the zones unless you wanted to. It's just, it's all about the addressing on those receivers. But yes, you can have a mixed system, and I may have thrown a, a more confusion into that um, by, by going into that much detail, but it is possible to do that. And if, you, uh, if you're doing that and you have questions about, well, you know, is this going to be okay, just contact tech support and we'll help, you know, step you through it and make sure that you're going to have everything set up right. So just give us a call. Thank you so much, Amy, and I want to say thank you so much for everyone who has attended. Uh, you can find more information on all of our products on elkproducts.com. And just a reminder that we will be sending you a follow-up email next week with a link to the webinar and other useful information on all of our two-way wireless products. Um, and then if you have further questions, you can call us at tech support, uh, 828 Three nine seven four two zero zero, or you can contact one of your sales reps in your area. Which, uh, if you don't know who your sales rep is in your area, you can 
uh, go on our website under the Contact Us tab and look at who is your sales rep in your area. And then again, be sure to like, follow, connect, and subscribe to us all on our social media sites. And I hope you all have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. And thank you so much from Elk. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everyone.